when you make up your mind to stay with the breath, one of the first things you learn is that your mind probably wasn't as made up as you thought it was. There are many minds and there are many ideas of what you could be doing with this next hour. And so when you have that original intention to stay here, you've got to find as many allies as you can. For after all, when the mind is training itself, it's one part of the mind training other parts of the mind. Or one faction training the other factions. You've got to identify who are the helpful ones and get as many of the different parts of your mind on your side. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha talks so much about the purpose of this practice being to put an end to suffering, put an end to stress. Because everybody in the mind wants to put an end to suffering. It's just that they have different ideas about what that would be and how to go about it. But that gives you a handle on everybody. But simply reasoning with the different parts of the mind is not always going to work. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath, to make sure that it's on the right side. It's comfortable coming in, feels good going out, makes it an attractive place to stay, a good place to stay. So when there are parts of the mind that are demanding immediate pleasure, you say, well, here it is. It may not be precisely what the pleasure they were thinking about, but there is a sense of ease, and learning to appreciate that gives you an extra handle, learning how to maximize that sense of well-being. Brings more of the members of the mind to your side. The Buddha recommends two recollections as well to remind yourself when things are looking discouraging that you do have some good parts to the mind. This recollection of virtue, recollection of generosity. And at the very least, these remind you that okay, you have done good. There are good members to your mind. You're not totally hopeless. You're not totally incapable of doing good in the world. And to remind you also that you are capable of overcoming some of the mind's more blatant forms of greed, aversion, and delusion. Because as the Buddha pointed out, the way we're defined as beings is around the act of feeding. To maintain your identity, you have to eat physical food, and there's also mental and emotional food that you take in. And John Lee talks about the skill of communicating with animals. He doesn't come out and say that he did this, but he talks about it as if he's had direct experience with it. And one of the big questions you ask is, what have you been eating? Have you been eating well? They'll be happy to talk about that, because that's the big concern about their lives. When the Buddha talks about recollecting past lives, he says one of the topics is, what was your food? So much of our lives are taken up with feeding. And it's good to see that there are parts of the mind that are not totally absorbed in the feeding. There's something that wants to go beyond your identity as simply as a, a being who feeds. And generosity and virtue are two things that really bring that into the mind, make it clear. One of the lessons you learn well, from generosity, one of the lessons you learn is that you do have freedom of choice. You're not constantly just feeding, 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 and hoarding. Now there are times when you're giving something to someone in hopes of getting something from them, but there are other times when it's purely out of generosity. You see that you've got something that somebody else needs, and you may have a sense that you need it, but you're going to give it up because it felt better to give it up, whatever the reason might be good to reflect on that. 
think about when you, in the past, have given things purely out of generosity. It wasn't Christmas, and it wasn't birthday or anything like that where you're customarily supposed to give, but you felt simply, I want to give this, and you do. Reflect back on that. The Buddha says that looking into the workings of the mind when you're being generous helps teach you a lot of things, a lot of lessons that can then be applied to the meditation. The same with virtue. You hold to certain principles, partly because you know that if you harm other people, they're going to turn around and harm you. But it goes beyond that. There's a sense of honor. There's a sense of dignity that comes with having a principle that you don't betray and learning how to stick with it. The qualities of mindfulness that are required to remember that principle so you don't slip out of forgetfulness. Alertness to actually watch what you're doing. These are skills that are going to be applied to your meditation. As with generosity, that basic lesson is you're going to be happier by giving things up. There's a passage where the Buddha is talking to the monks. They're staying, I think, at Chaitawana, and he says, you know, if someone came and started burning all the branches and twigs and cutting down the trees in the monastery here, would you complain that they're burning you or that they're cutting you down? And the monks say, no, the trees and the twigs, they're somebody else. They're, they're not us. They're not ours. And the Buddha said, in the same way, what isn't yours, let go of it. Letting go of it will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. That's very different from the usual thing. What isn't yours, try to grab hold of it so you, you can make it yours. But as he's pointing out, if you lay claim to things and you're opening yourself to all kinds of prob problems, things that other people will take or destroy, or things that will just wear out on their own, if your happiness depends on those things, if your self-identity depends on those things, you're putting yourself in a bad position. So the act of generosity teaches you one very important lesson, is that working on developing the qualities of mind, even at the price of giving up things, and often it, these qualities do require that you give them up, you end up better off. You've got something more valuable. So as we're sitting here, and there are all kinds of thoughts that could entertain the mind, but you're willing to give them up because you realize they don't lead to anything of any substance. They're largely a waste of time. You've got the time now to meditate, make the most of it, try to develop those qualities in the mind that are worth a lot more than just the, the casual pleasure of entertaining yourself with different thoughts. And above all, with both cases of generosity and virtue, one of the important lessons you learn that you've been gaining practice in is lessons of heedfulness. You know, that realization you can't just simply eat, eat, eat as you like, or take, take, take as you like, or do whatever you want to, want to do with other people. Your actions are going to have consequences not just for your own safety, but also for maximizing your well-being. It's good to give things up, and it's good to be principled, to have certain boundaries in your behavior. Because after all, what is concentration? You are placing boundaries around the mind. You're trying to develop an expansive mind, but it requires that you give up a lot of the topics you normally think about. Certain things are off-limits. Thoughts about sensual desire, thoughts about ill will, topics that make you restless and anxious, your doubts about whether you want to be here meditating, you've got to just drop all those. Sleepiness comes up and you can't say, whoop, that's a sign I've got to rest. You have to fight it. And so think of the ways in which in the past you've fought the temptation to break some of your precepts or do something that was immoral. 
and think of how you've also been able to talk yourself into giving something away, letting it go, even with something that you really liked. Again, the lessons you learn from those activities are going to be really useful as you meditate. So the recollection of generosity and recollection of virtue, it's usually taught as a practice for giving yourself energy, remind yourself of your value as a human being. These reflections also give you some important lessons on how to meditate, how to take advantage of the skillful members of the mind, how to recognize the skillful members of the mind, and reflect on how they work and how they are able to take over, how they're able to be dominant. When there's so many members of the mind, they just want to eat, 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 take, take, take. want to be free to roam around as they like. So when you find that you need some encouragement and also need some ideas about how to do better at your meditation, these two recollections can be very useful.